Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I'm Zehan Rashid from Happy Strong Family. Today I am having the pleasure of interviewing, uh, speaking to a very dear host, uh, Fazia Khurram, who is our stretch, stress prevention strategist. Uh, Fazia has been on our show before. We've had some valuable insights from her experience and her background into this very important topic. Uh, We've had uh, the report of the Kendall, Canadian Mental Health Association come out literally 10 days ago, which showed that there was an increase in anxiety, increase in the levels of stress that people are feeling, and overall a deterioration of the mental state of those that were interviewed. That's almost 2,000 people. So we felt it was quite appropriate to talk about something that is ongoing. COVID-19, of course, has given us all a very new angle uh, to how we cope with stress, uh, we cope well, and if we don't cope well. So I thought it would be useful to have uh, somebody with expertise, with knowledge, with a previous background uh, from stress and prevention in particular, which is what we want. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce you quickly to Sister Fazia Khurram and just ask her uh, a few questions so that we can start relating to this topic from the point of view of the audience and say, for example, what are the, some of the challenges, Sister uh, Fazia, that isolation has caused uh, to be seen in, in the pandemic that we are facing? Uh, uh Brother Sahan, thank you for having me. Um, you know, we're, while we are in a pandemic and while actions such as social distancing are necessary to uh, reduce the spread of COVID-19, um, they can leave us feeling isolated, lonely, and can increase stress and anxiety. And, you know, we're hearing um, more and more about stress and people feeling stress. But what does that really mean? I mean, what does that look like when it shows up? We all know that stress can worsen mental health conditions. But did you know that stress can also cause changes in appetite, uh, changes in your energy levels, your interests, your desire? Um, stress can cause fear, anger, frustration, sadness, worry, a whole host of emotions, even a disconnect or shut down in communication. Um, how about if you if you have interrupted sleep or nightmares that can be caused by stress or even difficulty making decisions and concentrating. And then stress can also cause physical effects such as body aches, headaches, stomach pains, even skin rashes, or um, even people that have like already a chronic health uh, condition that's existing, it can worsen those um, health problems. So the way stress shows up in our life, there's no one blanket statement. It's, it's going to show up differently. And what we need to do is we need to be mindful and recognize those behaviors and those patterns and see when, when things like that start to change in us, we need to be responsible and, and reach out and seek help. Sakhlakhair, Sister uh, Fawzia, for that excellent introduction. Uh, I have to say that uh, having been a, a professional of some sort in medicine over a period of a number of years, I didn't myself realize how heavily uh, the state of the mind actually influences the state of the body. And indeed, the, the state of the human uh, being altogether, uh, people can be emotionally more on the edge because they're stressed. People can physically feel unwell, as you quite uh, correctly pointed out. Uh, and it can surely affect all those that are around them secondarily and therefore result in a very tense and almost a, a very, uh, what I would say, anxious state that prevails over people who are around such an individual. Um, being uh, very aware of our uh, state as a Muslim uh, community and finding that sometimes this state is almost treated like taboo to be stressed, to be anxious, to be depressed. I've heard those terms where people have found themselves more stressed by the fact that they are stressed about the stress that they have. Uh, not only that, but they are stressed by the fact that they cannot speak to anybody about how, what they've been through, which I find particularly problematical to say it's one thing to be sick. But if I was diabetic and if I had heart disease and if I had any other similar conditions, I can imagine that if I was unable to go to a physician or to speak to a family member about something that was bothering me, concerning me. Um, so perhaps uh, we can ask you a little bit more about how does uh, this beautiful tradition of Islam that we share, how does this offer some solutions, some kind of, uh, if you like, strategies to deal with what clearly is a, a very human and a very 
ongoing problem. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's such a great way to put it. It is a very human and ongoing problem because it's natural to feel stress and to have anxiety and be worried, and especially during a pandemic. But we can learn to cope in healthy ways, and uh, that really makes us more resilient. And it, we're lucky, alhamdulillah, because Islam also teaches us ways to help ourselves and our community. The first thing I think it's important to understand that the current situation is outside of our control, right? Accepting that we can't control everything is a major key to managing anxiety and stress. You know, Allah tells us in Surah 8, verse 30, and Allah is the best of planners, right? But that doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility towards our own well-being. For Allah also tells us in Surah 13, verse 11, indeed, Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. So we have to be mindful. We have to take the responsibility. Um, so what are some healthy ways for us to cope with stress? Let's, let's look at the things that are going on right now. Um, how many people are glued to their TV sets just watching the news, right? So limit your exposure to the news. Um, although it's important for us to know and be aware of what's going on, we don't need the minute-by-minute -minute play. We don't need the headline and the details from every article and every news station. So we have to be mindful of how much exposure we're allowing ourselves to absorb because this is going to have a direct effect on our mental health. It's going to have a direct effect on our physical health. The other thing I want to really point out is the importance of setting up daily routines, having a morning routine, having a nighttime routine. So important because when we set up a routine, what that does is in a time where things are outside of our control, having a routine is something that we set for ourselves. It gives us a sense of being in control. That gives us a, a feeling of safety, right? It allows us to create that comfortable place for ourselves and allows us to disconnect from all of the overwhelm if we're just focusing on being in the middle of a storm that's outside of our control. The thing that we're very blessed with as Muslims is we start the day and we end the day with Salah. And throughout, Allah has provided timings for us. And if we actually plan our day and plan our routines around those, those times, not only does it help us with maintaining our routines, but it helps with time management. And you'll find that when we're stuck at home and we're just, you know, in, in lockdown or we're isolated, uh, we're creating new routines, working from home, being with the family all the time, we lose track of time. And so um, putting our day together and just managing everything that we need to do around Salah times helps us with time management. So we should take advantage of that. The other thing is let's plan our meals and snacks. Just because we're home doesn't mean we can be snacking and eating at all times of the day. Let's plan it. Let's take the advantage of the fact that everyone is home. We can sit down with the family. We can have meals together. Um, we can cook together. You know, if you have children in the house, start preparing snacks with them and then sit down and enjoy a snack with your kids and with your family. Um, and when you eat, don't don't eat just for the sake of eating. Eat with the mindfulness that you're eating to nourish the body. This is so important um, because a healthy gut is going to give you a healthy mind. There's a direct connection there. And if anybody's watching and they need help with that, they can reach out to Happy Strong Family. And I'm sure we can help you put together a meal plan that would be best for you and for your family. The other thing that's so important is exercise. And we all hear it, and you know, it's important to exercise. But what that looks like is going to be different for each of us. Maybe for some people, it's taking a walk every day. We're lucky, alhamdulillah, the weather is getting nicer. So we can actually go out and enjoy the weather, take a walk, take your kids. Maybe they want to go bike riding. Um, maybe you want to do some gardening, you know, just start to enjoy the outside weather. Um the gyms are closed. So for people that go to the gym and you feel like you're not, 
you're not able to go there, there are so many resources now available online through Zoom. There are exercise groups, there's yoga groups, there's um, you know aerobics groups. You can join in with these groups and you can work out um, with a group of people, but you're doing it from the comfort of your own home, right? There's also YouTube videos. If you don't want to join a group, YouTube something and just follow that, uh, the, the video. So there's, there's a lot of options. Um, and for women that are home and say that they've been working, you know, doing housework all day, that's not equivalent of exercise. You still need to take some time out and do some exercise aside from the work that goes on in the home. And by now, we should start getting into the mindset that the housework isn't just for women. Everyone should be contributing to that. You know, husbands should be playing a role. Children, as they get older, can take on more responsibilities around the housework. So um, it's not a burden for just one person. The other thing is getting a good night's sleep. That's so key. Alyssa Panazala created nighttime for us to sleep so the body can heal and repair and take care of itself. So we have to set up, again, that nighttime routine that I was talking about that can look different for each of us. But what I mean by, by having a nighttime routine is before bed, start, you know, uh, maybe dim the lights, get rid of the devices, no device time for at least half an hour. Don't watch the news just before you go to bed. That's going to wake up your mind to a very, you know, a hyper thoughts. You want to do something that's very calming and relaxing. We're lucky, alhamdulillah, that we have our Isha Salah. After Salah, we can do some thicker. But aside from that, one of the things that I always recommend is just before you go to bed on your bedside table, have a journal and write three to five things that you were grateful for that day. You know, just it starts to train the brain to look for those things to be grateful for during the day. And Allah SWT tells us throughout the Quran, if only you were grateful. So we have to look for those things that we can be grateful for. They're always there. Even in times of adversity, we can walk away and we can look back at something and say, this is what I benefited from that. And this is what I'm grateful for. So I think a gratitude journal is an excellent way because then you're going to bed with uh, your mindset is in, in gratitude and you wake up and you that that's influenced your sleep. It's had an effect on your sleep. Um, the other thing that's important is for us to take some time for our own solitude. People don't realize the importance of taking time away from the family. It doesn't mean you have to leave the house or leave the family. Find a quiet spot. Find a place where you're comfortable and sit there and be with your thoughts and just start to reflect on, um, you know, what your day is like, what's been going on, how are you spending your time, which relationships do you feel that you need to pour into and nourish, how are you, you know, practicing self-care and self-compassion, all of these things are so important. And we know from the stories of his life that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would go to Mount Hira to meditate. And in fact, that's where he got his first revelation. So we have his example as well as the importance of taking that time for solitude. Um, the other thing is, you know, we're, we're at home, but let's take some time out to do things that we enjoy. So if you enjoy arts and crafts, do some arts and crafts. If you feel that gardening is something you want to try, go out and do some gardening, but spend some time doing something that just gives you joy, something that you have a desire for. It's your passion. Um, if it's reading, sit down with a book every day and, and read a book. Um, the other thing we can ta uh, do is we have to be mindful of what's going on with us and with our thoughts. So if we recognize that we're not following our daily routines for several days, perhaps we need to reach out and speak to someone for support. Perhaps we need to join a virtual support group. Maybe you need to reach out to your health practitioner or your doctor um, and just talk to someone about what's going on. Because if we don't reach out and talk 
and just absorb everything and pretend that it's not happening and push through. Something is going to happen to trigger an explosion and everything is going to come out all at once. So we have to be mindful of what's going on, what our thoughts are, and we deal with things as they come up so we don't allow them to build up. This is so important. And then the other thing is join community organizations through Zoom. And, you know, there's so many virtual events that you can attend that would just um, teach you something new, expose you to some new information. Um, being part of a community, even if it's an online community, is so great for your um for your self-esteem. It's so great because as humans, that's what we want. We want to be, you know, we want to feel like we've been, we're included and we we try to create an inclusive community. And that's what Islam really teaches us, right? Um, you know, the importance of coming together and pray together in, in a Jamaat and having the congregation and checking up on each other. If you have a friend or someone that you haven't heard from in some time, reach out to them, just do a check-in and see how they're doing. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, that's uh, just such a rich uh, back uh, 15 minutes of advice. Uh, I'll try and sum it up for the audience who were uh, listening to what really is a very set of beneficial instructions. I found your idea of routine a very powerful routine, a uh, very powerful idea. The fact that there is a routine in one's life, the fact that one's grateful for one's blessings, the fact that one takes time to look at others' uh, concerns as well as one's own. Uh, this community idea I particularly appreciate because I know there's a lot of people who by nature are not able to reach out to others because of this, this particular uh, sometimes it's just the mindset that makes people think, who will want to talk to me? They're, they've got bad things to do. I hear from people regularly, oh, you're so busy, I, I couldn't be bothered. I didn't want to bother you. And I think to myself, you know, I, I must have not made myself feel uh, this individual to want to talk. And to, uh, to uh, you know, I, I personally think if somebody lays their heart open in front of you, Allah has blessed you that they feel that they can trust you. Uh, and subhanAllah, this last uh, few minutes of advice that you offered about reaching out to others, uh, reaching out to perhaps a family member that we have not spoken to in a while, uh, perhaps calling a friend, perhaps checking on a neighbor, perhaps going and doing something in the masjid for men in particular, without anybody asking, just go and clean the, 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 the masjid, uh, go and take care of the paper, go and take care of anything that needs taken care of. This idea of contributing versus consuming, I found, is so rich for the soul. It's really so powerful that when one becomes in the service, I remember the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, a person who is busy in the service of others, Allah becomes their server. Allah ta'ala takes care of their affairs. SubhanAllah, how beautiful. How, how beautiful is that? And I just find that such a powerful influence on my psyche to say, SubhanAllah, when you become a person of help to others, which is what? Allah's creation. We know the famous hadith where a woman was forgiven because she fed water to a cat. I mean, how many of us really think of life like that? Yeah. The fact that on Day of Judgment, Allah Ta'ala will ask somebody, I was sick and you didn't visit me. I mean, when I first read that hadith, I can tell you many years ago, it stunned me. Mm -hmm. I didn't really understand how could Allah need the help of a human being? But the, the, the metaphorical aspect of this, once it became clear to me, they said, it's the act that it's important. It's the process that this is all about. It's not about results. Allah can create results without any of us doing anything at all. But it's that effort that we put in to say, I made somebody smile today. I made somebody a little less stressed out. So I, I find this concept really very, very, I think, applicable to the conditions that we are under right now. And also, I think few people taking advantage of isolating the self, not for the sake of being a loner, but from the center of yourself of self-reflection. What is my life <laughs> like? What is it that I most passionately think about? What are my moments of worry all about? I remember Imam uh, Hamza Yusuf, a very famous American scholar, saying, remember, any concern will always be, literally, it will be... It will be reduced if you think about three things uh, and he said number one whatever it is that's bothering you there could have been something worse than that which is difficult to think of and things are going wrong <laughs> secondly he said whatever it is is usually 
about your dunya, about the world. It is not about your deen. It's not about your relationship with Allah, usually. And <clears throat> lastly, whatever it is, it's still happening here. It's not happening on the day you're standing in front of Allah. So you still have time to fix it. I just found those three things very powerful when I reflect upon things that go wrong. So uh, just working on that theme a little bit more, you mentioned the Prophet's life and how he used to isolate himself and for, he did that for many, many months before the the uh, revelation came to him in the form of Iqra, as you quite rightly point out for the audience. Uh, reflect on uh, for us uh, some of those moments of the Prophet's life himself where he appealed to Allah Ta'ala where he prayed to Allah, I can remember one particular one, and I'll take the precedent from you just to set us on that track, that he made dua every day, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal hazm. Just to translate it for myself and others, Oh Allah, I ask your protection against sadness and anxiety. I found that when I, again, when I read this dua, again I thought to myself, the Prophet was sad? What would he be sad about? Then our Imam pointed out, he was a human being. There is never any example that he has reflected, that he's shown us, and it doesn't apply to us. It would be pointless to have a person who didn't really represent humanity in a form where humanity could relate to him to say, you know what, if I am sad, so was the Prophet He was sad when revelation was delayed for several weeks after the first revelation. He was sad when his son died. He was sad when the people in Taif, where he went to appeal to them, to consider Islam when they stoned him. So we see sadness in his life and his ability to deal with it. So uh, perhaps, Fazi, if you could help us out with some uh, prophetic examples uh, of other prophets and him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And you know, it's such a great point that you made that the, the prophets, may Allah be pleased with them all, were, were human, right? And, and they had the same emotions. And so, you know, we, they, in, if we look in the Quran, right, there's, there's so many examples for us. But the one thing that we have to understand and we have to believe is that we're stronger than we think we are. And more importantly, Allah is with us, right? The challenges that we go through are meant to bring us closer to him. They're meant to make us more resilient, right? Each and every one of us has a purpose when he put us in this world. And everything that we go through, all of the, the, the challenges and the adversities that happen that are meant to make us stronger, meant to bring us closer to him, they happen because they're bringing us closer to becoming the person that he wants us to be the person that has to show up in order to deliver the purpose that he put us in this world for, right? What, what our purpose is. And we have proof of that because Allah tells us in Quran, Surah 23, verse 62, on no soul do we place a burden greater than it can bear, right? So whatever it is that we're going through, know that you're not alone. You're not alone. Not only is Allah with you, but there Allah has created people. He has created resources and supports for you. This is the community. This is the family. These are the people that we lean on. And these are the people that we reach out to. And we have to be mindful of that, that we, we reach out to them in, need, in the time of need. That's not a weakness. It's actually quite courageous to do that, to reach out your hand and say, I need some help. We often are conditioned to think that we should just handle things and deal with them on our own. But no, we, we have, you know, we have like the whole ummah. Why is Islam always talking about a community, about the ummah, about how we are there for each other and everyone? It's because community is so important. We have to learn to lift each other up. We have to learn that whatever it is that we've been blessed with, a part of that, other people have a huck on it. There's a responsibility that we have to giving back to the community. And if right now all we have is time, then a portion of that time is the responsibility of what we take and we give back to the community. And that may be through reaching out and supporting someone else. It may be through learning something new so you can help someone else. 
help yourself. And then from what you've learned, take those examples and help other people. Excellent. Yeah, you, you you talked about uh, prophetic examples. And, you know, like I said, the Quran has story after story of the prophets and all that they endured. And in those stories are lessons for us to reflect upon. And oftentimes we think, well, you know, that that's not going to happen in today's day and time. But it's not the actual event that they went through. It's the lessons that are there for us to learn. In fact, Allah says in Surah 12, verse 111, uh, and this is about the Quran and the, the Holy Scriptures, there was certainly in their stories a lesson for those under, uh, for those un, of understanding. Never was the Quran a narration invented, but a confirmation of what was before and a detailed explanation of all things and guidance and mercy for people who believe. SubhanAllah. This is Allah telling us, this is your book of life. Everything that you need for guidance and my mercy, his mercy, is in this book. Such a blessing, such a blessing. So we, when we read the stories, we think, okay, well, you know, um, this happened to Prophet uh, Nuh al and this happened to, you know, Prophet Musa al those things aren't going to happen today. But what did they experience? What was the feeling that they went through? How did they show up in the midst of that adversity? And one story that comes to mind is that of Prophet Ayub. You know, Prophet Ayub was a prophet. He had been blessed with a good, um, with good health, a big family, plenty of wealth. But as a test from Allah, he lost everything. And he was inflicted by a disease which led everyone to desert him, right? He was isolated except for his wife. And this lasted for a long time, in fact, years. But Prophet Ayub, remained patient. He kept thanking Allah and he was still steadfast in his worship. And what happened was Allah cured him of his disease and he got back everything that he lost, right? So if we look at this story and we dive into it, what are some of the lessons that we can learn? First of all, his relationship with Allah was not dependent on the blessings of Allah. SubhanAllah. You know, as the adversity continued, his relationship did not deteriorate. His relationship with Allah did not deteriorate. Um, he didn't have doubts. He didn't have those negative thoughts, which maybe a lot of people are thinking right now. Why is this happening to me? Why am I going through this? He didn't have those. He knew what he was responsible for, which was his, uh, his worship, and he was steadfast in it. He didn't stop worshiping. And he didn't lose it, hope in Allah. So as we go through this time, as we go through all of, you know, the whole world going through a lockdown, and I think we're on number three now with the, the you know, the wave coming through, and people are starting to doubt, and people are starting to question. That's shaitan planting the seed. What we need to understand is that Allah is with us. He is the best of all planners. As long as we continue to do what our responsibility is, we have no control of the outcome. We are only responsible for our thoughts and our actions and our behaviors. Leave the outcome to the person who's going to have control of it. And that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Excellent, Fawzia. That, that's very good summation of uh, really what would be the last few minutes. So we're going to, inshallah, try and wrap this up quickly. Uh, I, I, I'd like to see if Fazia can give us a few points just to finish it off. So what are some of the, uh, I think, do we have any questions that the audience has? So my uh, program moderator is also pointing out some questions that we'd like uh, Fazia to uh, take on. If I can perhaps uh, uh, look at these questions. Uh, and Okay, so we'll uh, allow Brother uh, Arif, who's our program moderator, He's going to put some questions through. These are uh, moderated questions. So, inshallah, I'll allow him to go through and see if there are any questions that uh, Sister Fazia can be asked, please. Thank you. Jazakallah. Uh, Welcome, uh, Sister Fazia, uh, Dr. Rashid, one of the questions that we got in um, is, 
how do I help my kids deal with their stress, especially during those COVID times? Okay, that's a great question. And yeah, oftentimes when we think about stress, we don't think that it's the children also that are going through it. And I would say, um, try to keep communication open. Just the same way we went through all of these things that you can apply to yourself, apply them with your kids. Ask them what it is that they need, because oftentimes we see, you know, when when we're when we're stressed out, we act out in maybe we're short with our spouse. Maybe we're short with the kids and we we lose our temper easily and everything. And, and we, you know, we are aware that we're doing that, but we feel like it's out of our control. So now put yourself in the place of your child. So your child is going through stress. Maybe they don't have the language to exactly communicate what's going on so it's going to show up in misbehaving it's going to show up in a little bit of a tantrum it's going to show up in behaviors that you're not happy with so rather than scolding them and rather than trying to give them a time out and a punishment sit down and have a conversation with them and try to understand what's going on with them and ask them what they need from you how is it that you can show up to support your child don't tell them what they need, ask them what they need. And then listen, just don't talk, let, let them speak and just listen to what they ask for. And then from there, you can, you have a better idea of how to move forward. That's excellent advice, Sister Fazia. Uh, I must admit with children, this has been an ongoing concern from the members of the community that we come across. Because I think a lot of us, and I'm guilty of it also, I think we consider seven and eight year old children to really be children. I think we sometimes forget that in this age and the time in which children are getting so much information, some advertent, some inadvertent, and sometimes, like you pointed out earlier, when the media is such a big part of our daily life, uh, we don't realize that children are actually absorbing a lot of that information without the correct context. Uh, they hear and see, but they don't actually relate because they don't have that mental maturity and mindset. A lot of us don't seem to be able to cope with it. We definitely don't expect children to. So, Zakalaka, that's excellent to allow ourselves to communicate with our children better. I think we may have one or two other questions. I'm going to let Brother Arif proceed with more questions, inshallah. Zakalla. Uh, another question we have is um, sometimes when we're in the moment, we don't know that we're actually suffering from stress or even chronic stress. How does one identify? either mental or physical signs of stress? That, that's a great question. And I think that's why having routines is so important. Because when you have routines set up, you, you've got things that you are doing and it almost becomes habitual, right? Um, and you just know. It's like we, we pray, we know we pray. And if we start missing once a lot, then you miss two. And then you've gone a few days without praying. You know something is wrong because you're out of routine. And it's the same thing with, um, with, our, like with our behavior. We have to be mindful of what our routines are. We have to be mindful of what things look like when we start to be you know, short-tempered. Um, the other thing is it's important to have people in our life that we can reach out to for support. And when you have someone that you've had that conversation with, that this is going to be one of your support people that you're going to reach out to, then it's also important to let them know what types of behaviors they may need to look for, that they can recognize that there needs to be a check-in done with you. So if you start to, um, you know, if you start to behave a certain way, Someone that knows you may say, this is a little bit of out of character for you. This is not usually how you are. How are things going? Are you okay? And having a check-in. Because we can't put all of the burden on ourselves to always be mindful of everything. We have to take that responsibility for ourselves, yes. But it's a very healthy thing to do, having some support people that can also do check-ins with you and just keep in touch and have conversations so that they would help you and you would help them. That's excellent. And I, I like that idea of giving the benefit of doubt uh, because I find when people are short with uh, close family members in particular, uh, I usually notice the lack of trust in the other person's feeling. Uh, to, to use an example, if somebody is, as you said, short and snappy, 
we could perhaps give them the benefit of doubt. They may be having a bad day. Maybe they've been caught on the wrong spot. Maybe they've just not found their wavelength today, etc. There are really so many ways to allow a person, if you like, moving room. And I think okay. that, that concession for each other, we tend to do better when we are, uh, if you like, recognizing each other's shortfall. We are all going to fail at some point or the other in time. <laughs> and I think it's that recognition that we have moving room and we're not always pushed into a corner at the slight behest of somebody's you know, uh, transgression. Then I think it allows a, mo- a lot more, I think, space for people to function better. I'm going to allow, inshallah, Brother Arif to have one more uh, last question before we wrap up the podcast, inshallah. Jazakallah. Um, so this is the last question for, for today, inshallah. Um, how likely is it that chronic stress can lead to depression? And if I see this in my elders, what can I do about it? Oh, that's a really good question. So, um, you know, every situation is different. Um, we are seeing, especially with elders, that, you know, they're going through um, they're going through this, the chronic stress, and they're also getting into being depressed. And, and, you know, what we need to understand is, like I said, for it's human nature, we want to feel included. We want to feel like we're a part of something. And oftentimes what happens, especially in our fast-paced life, you know, now everything's a bit slowed down because of COVID, but we have such a fast paced life generally, especially here in North America. And what happens is that our elders sort of get pushed to the side and they are from a generation where their whole existence depended on, it was identified with who they were, which was being a parent, being a caregiver and being, you know, now the grandparent maybe, right? And so when they feel that they are no longer needed in that role, they really don't have any other way to identify themselves. And so it's almost like a feeling of like, who am I and where do I fit in? And so what it what really needs to happen, again, I'm going to go back to communication because I feel like we don't do it enough and we don't communicate with people in order to hear what they're saying. Usually we communicate to just say what we want to say, but we don't communicate with people um, with the intention of trying to understand what they're trying to say and what they're feeling. And I think if we sit down and we have like a family night and sit down and do an activity where they feel um, included, have maybe set up where they can once a week do a live Zoom with a few of their friends and just have that connection. Because just like, you know, we're going through stress, our children are going through stress, our elders are also going through stress. And they're at a stage in their life where they feel like, what was my whole life for? Like, I I took care of my family, I took care of my kids, I did everything I was supposed to do. And here I am now, and I don't understand where I fit in. And it's, it's kind of, like sad if you think about it. And if we try to understand things from the other person's place of, you know, being and what they're going through, we can be a little bit more compassionate. We can have a little bit more empathy. And I I would say, just try to include them in what's going on and speak to them and ask them what it is that they need rather than telling them, this is what you need to do. This is what you should be doing. This is where you should... No, listen to them. Let them tell you what it is they want and how you ask how you can show up to support them in their needs. That's really been a very insightful uh, uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, I certainly have learned a lot myself. I hope my audience have enjoyed the podcast and I hope, inshallah, that we will have more of these because there surely is a whole mind reflection that's needed on these topics and regularly so because I think when we are proactive and we address these issues before they actually overwhelm us I think we're likely to have a much better response so I again want to thank you uh, very much for coming on the show and I hope inshallah we can have your uh, coming back on the show very soon again I also want all our audience uh, as usual you can check out more of such useful podcasts and other material on our website www.happystrongfamily.com they're always happy to get feedback. They're also help, uh, very happy to receive any other input from the, our audience. And inshallah, until the next time, uh, I'm Zehan Rashid, your host. Zakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Just like the hair for having me. Thank you, sister. Okay.